What do I do for a living? Sorry, maybe that one's too hard. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 Carrie Mulligan moments. I feel old, but not very wise. I'm clever and I'm listening, and don't patronize me because people have died and I'm not happy. You don't want to get anywhere. Me and Jim try. Oh, I want to We get... try. You sleep on the couch. For this list, we'll be looking at the standout scenes from this British actress's film and television work. We'll try to keep spoilers to a minimum, but we will still be talking about some key plot points. What's your favorite Carrie Mulligan moment? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Seize the Moment – The Dig In this Netflix drama, Mulligan plays Edith Pretty, a real-life English landowner. My interest in archaeology began like yours when I was scarcely old enough to hold a trowel. Despite being based on a true story, The Dig takes several liberties. Namely, Pretty was 56 at the beginning of this film's events, whereas Mulligan is still in her 30s. While this may be distracting for history buffs, Mulligan nonetheless rises to the occasion with an effective performance. One detail the filmmakers get right is that Pretty didn't have much longer to live, as she died following a stroke at the age of 59. We die and we decay. We don't live on. In one of the most touching moments, the sickly pretty comforts Peggy Piggott, an archaeologist trapped in a loveless marriage. Knowing that her own days are numbered, pretty encourages Piggott to seize the moment and not let true happiness slip away. Life is very fleeting. I've learned that. It has moments you should seize. Number 9. Confronting the Weeping Angels – Doctor Who before she broke out as a silver screen star, Mulligan appeared in arguably the best Doctor Who episode. I'm clever and I'm listening, and don't patronize me because people have died and I'm not happy. The Doctor is practically a supporting character in Blink, with the spotlight belonging to Mulligan's Sally Sparrow. In what is essentially a mini horror film, Sally is pursued by the Weeping Angels, aliens that turn to stone whenever somebody looks at them. Okay, boys, I know how this works. You can't move so long as I can see you. For their prey, even blinking can spell certain death. They are fast, faster than you could believe. Don't turn your back, don't look away, and don't blink. The episode accumulates with a heart-racing climax where Sally and her friend Larry are surrounded. Every time the lights flicker, the statue-like creatures draw closer. Although Sally and Larry seemingly find refuge in the TARDIS, the ship disappears. The Doctor cleverly traps the angels, however, as they all end up looking at each other, frozen forever. Number 8. The Piano – Mudbound In this hard-hitting historical drama, Mulligan brings great depth and resilience to Laura, a young woman who reluctantly moves to a farm with her husband and children. Laura isn't thrilled to learn that her racist father-in-law will be living with them as well. You always knew I want my own farm someday. No. I told you. Henry, I had no idea. I'm up. I would have remembered that. Although Laura makes many compromises, she draws a line when Pappy suggests getting rid of her piano to make way for his bed. Pappy, there's no room. Get rid of that piano. We could put a bed right there. Put a curtain around. It's true, we could. I don't want a bedroom in the middle of the living room. Yeah. She'd put me out. Taking her husband aside, Laura firmly asserts that they aren't removing her most treasured possession from the living room. It's the one civilized thing in this place. So your father can either sleep in the lean-to, or he can sleep in the bed with you, because I'm not staying here without my piano. <laughs> what are you? You are overtired. No, I'm not. The piano not only represents Laura's life before arriving on the farm, but also a part of her individuality that she's willing to fight for. In the end, the piano stays, and Pappy is forced to find other sleeping arrangements. Number 7. Real Human Being – Drive Drive is a masterclass of showing rather than telling. As such, Nicholas Winding Refn's neo-noir drama required actors who can get a lot of emotion across in an understated fashion. Mulligan and co-star Ryan Gosling excel in this department. Gosling's nameless driver is an empty vessel until he meets Mulligan's Irene and her son Benicio. What do you do? I drive. Like a limo drive? Or like for movies? In one of the film's few uplifting moments, the driver takes a detour with the woman he's beginning to love and the boy he's starting to view as his own. Driving to a secluded area, the three enjoy a pleasant escape from harsh reality. 
Set to an atmospheric soundtrack, it's a simple sequence overflowing with humanity. Real human being. Just as Irene awakens the driver's soul, Mulligan gives the movie a heart. That was good. He had a good time. Number 6. Daisy's Two Loves, The Great Gatsby Although Baz Luhrmann's adaptation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic novel received mixed reviews, the casting was spot on across the board. Mulligan as Daisy Buchanan is no exception. Although she's the epitome of class and wealth, Daisy isn't happy with her overbearing husband Tom. When Jay Gatsby re-enters the picture, she's tempted to reignite their relationship. All my life. I wish it could always be like this. The love triangle reaches its boiling point when Gatsby informs Tom of their affair, adding that Daisy never loved him. She only married you because I was poor and she was tired of waiting. It was a terrible, terrible mistake. But in her heart, in her heart, she never loved anyone but me. While that first part is true, Daisy confesses that Gatsby isn't the only man she's ever loved. You want too much. I love you now, isn't that enough? I can't help what's past. I did love him once, but I loved you too. A fight breaks out between the men, but the real conflict is within Daisy. The scene leaves the audience to wonder what Daisy wants out of life, and Mulligan beautifully conveys her conflicted nature. Number 5. Telling Off Lewin, Inside Lewin Davis Mulligan's Gene gets the funniest one-liners in this dark comedy, never missing an opportunity to remind Lewin what a colossal loser he is. Like King Midas' idiot brother. Well, okay. I see. Gene is especially annoyed that she might be pregnant with Lewin's child. While the baby could also be her husband's, Jean won't take any chances and decides to terminate the pregnancy. Asking Lewin to pay for the procedure, Jean berates him with one scathing insult after another. If you ever do it again, which is a favor to women everywhere, you should not. But if you do, you should be wearing condom on condom and then wrap it in electrical tape. Although her anger is mainly directed at Lewin, a part of Jean may also be frustrated with herself. After all, it takes two to tango. In a particularly brutal conversation at a cafe, Jean sums up Lewin in a nutshell. You know, you don't want to go anywhere, and that's why all the same shit is going to keep happening to you because you want it to. Jean essentially foreshadows the film's conclusion, which sees Lewin wind up back where he started. Number 4. New York, New York. Shame. In one of her bravest performances, Mulligan plays Sissy Sullivan, a singer who has a, let's say, complicated relationship with her brother Brandon. At a bar, Brandon watches Sissy perform the theme from New York, New York. We're all familiar with Liza Minnelli and Frank Sinatra's triumphant renditions of this song. Mulligan's slower interpretation brings a haunting sense of melancholy to the tune, however. I wanna wake up in a city that doesn't sleep. Although Sissy can come off as a very outgoing person, this scene provides a glimpse into the pain she conceals. Brandon identifies with the sadness and loneliness in her voice, practically moving him to tears. It's up to you, New York, New York. With the camera fixated on Sissy and Brandon for almost five straight minutes, the song speaks volumes about the anguish these siblings have in common. Number 3. Hard and Boring – An Education Bringing Mulligan her first Oscar nomination, An Education will be remembered as the film that made her a star. Mulligan shines as Jenny Meller, a 16-year-old student going on 17. Jenny is sophisticated beyond her years, yet wildly naive. You sound very old and wise. I feel old, but not very wise. Nowhere is this better exemplified than in this scene where Jenny confronts her headmistress. Nobody does anything worth doing with a degree. No woman, anyway. Having accepted a marriage proposal from the older David, Jenny decides to walk away from her studies. Despite the headmistress's objections, Jenny believes the road to Oxford will be hard, boring, and ultimately unfulfilling. My choice is to do something hard and boring or to marry my Jew. 
and go to Paris and Rome and listen to jazz and read and eat good food in nice restaurants and have fun. Anyone who's ever been a teenager can relate to Jenny's desire for a life full of passion and fun. Once Jenny leaves, however, she's given a schooling in how life works and the value of an education. Number 2. War's the only language, Suffragette. In one of her most underrated performances, Mulligan owns the screen as Maud Watts, a wife and mother who joins the women's suffrage movement. Although Maud is fictional, her struggle is all too real, and Mulligan's acting is full of raw honesty. You're a mother, Maud. You're a wife. My wife. That's what you're meant to be. Not just that anymore. As countless voices go unheard, Maud and her fellow suffragettes are driven to bomb statesman David Lloyd George's empty house. When confronted by Inspector Steed, Maud unleashes all of the anger, desperation, and repression that led to these violent measures. We break windows. We burn things. Because war's the only language men listen to. Because you've beaten us and betrayed us and there's nothing else left. Whether or not you agree with Maud's tactics, her words still ring true more than a century later. Just as the good fight is still being fought, Mulligan's performance is like a flame that can't be extinguished. You might lose your life before this is over. And we will win. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. We all complete Never Let Me Go. If you're not choked up, you may need a heart transplant. We all complete. Maybe none of us really understand what we've lived through. Grace talks to Alan, the greatest. Mamma Mia, here we go again. That's why I'm keeping this baby. I was in love with him for four years. Lamb, far from the Madden crowd. A meaty marriage proposal. Mr. Oak, there are things to consider. Is someone waiting for you? No, but that doesn't mean I'll marry you. Showing Joe the fire, wildlife, the expressions say everything. You gotta see what he finds so important. I'm sorry we both can't sympathize with him. Winnie dumps Jake, Wall Street, money never sleeps. You'll forget this sequel exists, but you won't forget Mulligan here. We're supposed to make each other feel safe. Otherwise, what, what's the point? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. I'm a nice guy. Promising young woman. Delivering what may be a career best performance, Mulligan transforms herself as Cassie Thomas, one of the most unpredictable characters of recent memory. This 30-year-old targets self-proclaimed nice guys who have other motives in mind. She also goes after women who have contributed to the problem, including an irresponsible dean. You're crazy. No. Tell me what room my daughter is in right now. I told you the same room Nina was in. I told you I don't remember that. Well, that's a shame. Cassie's most satisfying scene, however, finds her on a date with Christopher Mintzplass's Neil. As he prepares to take advantage of her, Cassie lets Neil know that she's stone cold sober. But that's good, isn't it? I think you should leave. Oh, now you want me to leave? Neil is horrified by this revelation, but Cassie isn't done tormenting him. They play a game of questions and answers with Neil scoring nothing but zeros. How long have I lived in the city? What are my hobbies? What's my name? Although she leaves him in one piece, Neil isn't inclined to forget Cassie, even if he can't remember her name. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.